These mics are streaming over the internet, so if you are speaking um, to us uh, on that microphone, you are also speaking to the rest of the world, at least those that are in the know uh, about legislature.main.gov. Um, so with that, and without further ado, we will begin uh, hearing testimony on LD 1282, an act to establish a Green New Deal for Maine. Uh, the sponsor, Representative Maximin, is with us to present the bill, and we'll go to proponents after that. Looks like starting with Matt Schlobohm and then Jason Shedlock. Representative Maximin, welcome. And we may hear from some co-sponsors during the day, I believe, although yes. um, they, will, I think, are going to be courteous and go a little later. Yes, we're going to give the young folks here an opportunity to testify. Uh, thank you, Representative Barry and Senator Lawrence and Absentia. My name is Chloe Maxman. I represent House District 88, which includes Chelsea, Jefferson, Whitefield, and part of Nobleboro. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak in support of LD 1282, an act to establish a Green New Deal for Maine. Before I begin my remarks, I wanted to introduce a few amendments to the bill, which y'all should have. Um, the first one is just cleaning up the long-term reduction goal in Section A2. It just includes the date, January 1st, 2040. In Section B-2, I have amended the task force appointments. So the Senate President will appoint members D, E, and F, which corresponds to a renewable energy producer, a young person under 21, and two members from the labor community. The Speaker of the House appoints members in Part G, which is three members from the business community and the governor appoints members A, B, and C, which are representative from the PUC, um, the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, and a climate scientist. In Part G of Section B2, I've added Hancock and Washington counties to the definition of coastal counties. They were unintentionally left out of the definition. Uh, I've added some language in Section B3 on meetings, which says that the task force has to meet in at least three different locations in Maine. Uh, in Section B5, I've added some language that says that we can use findings from the task force report to introduce legislation in 2020 during the second regular session. Lastly, a new part is being added to the bill. Part E will create a requirement for hiring apprentices in the construction of electricity generation facilities in the state. Subject to the availability of qualified applicants, these construction progress Projects are required to employ apprentices from registered apprenticeship programs as a certain percentage of all persons employed for the project. And folks will be speaking to that piece as well. So that completes my amendments to the bill. I grew up on my family's farm in Nobleboro, and for as long as I can remember, I have loved our home more than anything. When I was 12 years old, I began to understand the profound impacts of climate change. Since then, I've dedicated my life to fighting for Maine, I see climate change as the biggest threat to our shared home, the vibrancy of our economy, Maine's culture, and our way of life, past, present, and future. We all know what will happen to our oceans, lakes, rivers, forests, fields, farms, snow, seasons, and economy if the worst of climate change comes to pass. Maine's climate will be more like that of Maryland. Our winter snow season is expected to be half of what it is today, shortening snowmobile season, which is a $3 billion annual industry, by 70%. Sea level rise could be up to two feet by the end of the century, jeopardizing all our coastal communities. Our forests, the foundation of a $1.4 billion industry, will be forever altered. The Gulf of Maine, which fosters Maine's 393 million annual fishing industry, is already warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans. Our $160 million annual fruit and vegetable crops will suffer under drought, heat, and unpredictable weather. This means that, we, that all that we know and love about Maine is currently under threat. My childhood of ice fishing, snowmobiling, fishing, and farming is already so different from what I experience today. The changes are here and will only get worse. I will not stand by as climate change forever alters Maine and all that we love. Throughout my 14 years of working on this issue, I'm 26 now, I've recognized key themes that form the foundation of this bill. First, we need policy at all levels of government. We need national action to transition away from fossil fuels, but we also need bold state action. Maine is the most rural state in the country and the oldest state by age in the country. We need a just transition framework that is by and for our unique economy, population, and way of life. 
That responsibility falls to us as lawmakers. It is one of the reasons that I ran for office. Second, new policies need broad-based grassroots support that can unite all of us. Our fight for our future must rest on a foundation of bold legislation. The idea for this bill emerged from conversations that I had knocking on doors in my district. I heard the need for growing industries, lowering property taxes, creating good jobs, protecting our environment, and building a foundation for a vibrant Maine future. LD-1282 is crafted to address these goals. It is born and bred in District 88 and all rural working Maine. This bill is also crafted in close collaboration with Maine's labor community, many of whom you will hear from today. You may have heard that the national AFL-CIO came out in opposition to the National Green New Deal. The Maine AFL-CIO is the first state affiliate in the country to endorse Green New Deal legislation. That is because this bill is about bringing voices to the table that are usually excluded from the climate conversation and building the kind of political momentum that is required to address climate change. LD-1282 is Maine's unique approach to a Green New Deal, and it also sets an example for our nation of how to build broad, inclusive coalitions. Today, you will hear from many members of this coalition, including many young Mainers. They have been part of the movement to bring climate justice to the forefront of political dialogue across the nation and in Maine. Their voices are the beacon of moral clarity that these times require. Third, the transition to renewable energy must treat all Mainers fairly and equitably. One of the greatest injustices of climate change is that those who have contributed the least to the crisis are impacted the most. Maine is a perfect example. We rank 45th for energy-related CO2 emissions in the country, even though our entire way of life and economy are at stake. That's why this bill asks, how do we ensure that the transition to renewable energy is fair and just for all Mainers? we have an opportunity to make sure that no Mainer is left behind. And that is also the purpose of the Commission on a Just Transition, to report annually so that we're ensuring that no Mainer is left behind. <coughs> Lastly, despite the massive crisis that we face, there is incredible economic opportunity for Maine, especially in the development of new occupations, workforce capabilities, and employment growth. This Maine Green New Deal is very different from the one on the national stage. It is targeted legislation, not a broad resolution. The bill focuses on economic growth for all Mainers. It is rooted in rural and working Maine, and it echoes the voices of District 88. As we talk about economic opportunities of renewable energy in Maine, we must be thoughtful, intentional, thorough, and strategic. We have the potential to revitalize many parts of Maine and create sustainable industries. Some might say that a task force is a way to avoid substantial engagement with this challenge. I disagree. As the legislature's recent experience with the opioid task force has shown, the task force model can effectively combine strategy with actionable legislation. LD-1282 charges a committed group of diverse stakeholders to collaborate in developing a powerful, effective strategy for our state's energy future, and one that will produce specific, realistic, and necessary legislation starting in 2020. The task force represents our best opportunity to chart a well-considered and actionable course for Maine. Working to fight climate change is daunting and exhausting. Never before has humanity faced such an overwhelming systemic crisis that affects every single facet of our society with an urgent timeline for action that our political system typically strains to achieve. But it is the most important work for me as a Mainer it is the most important work that we have as policymakers entrusted with securing a vibrant economic, social, and cultural future for Maine. It is time for Maine to lead. It is time for us to lead. We cannot stop fighting for what we love. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Representative Maxson. Questions from the committee? And while we greatly um, um, understand people's enthusiasm, um, one committee rule, just, just so, so you know, going forward, um, is that we don't test, we don't um, cheer or boo or respond in, in um, those ways in a committee hearing. Um, and that's really just for the, the order um, that is required uh, of the, the process. So um, we do appreciate your, your enthusiasm. Any questions for Representative Maxman? <coughs> Seeing none, thank you very much. Representative Kessler. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and welcome to our committee. 
Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, with these committee amendments, was was this uh, part about apprenticeships? Was that uh, added uh, in part by the influence of the AFL CIO? Um, the part about apprenticeship programs was born out of the deep relationship that this bill has with the labor community <coughs> and our collaboration. And there are folks here today who can speak in depth to what that program means. <coughs> Next up, we have uh, Matt Schlo 